Well, welcome to Coming Up Higher. This is Alicia and Whitney. And we have a very special guest today that uh, we've come to, to know uh, over the phone and over text yeah. message and over social media. And we just feel like she's family now. Mm -hmm. And we're so excited about all that she's doing. Uh, Maria Laricella. And she is the founder of an active president of Humanity Del Sol and uh, the organization and on the board since 2012. She began her journey in development in that industry at a young age. However, it was her love of travel and culture that led her to become a social entrepreneur and the founder of this nonprofit. And she also has a for-profit too, which we'll awesome. get into. And she is dedicated to helping change the lives of, of youth that come from and high trauma orphans through mentorship, livelihood, education, and alternative therapies. And so welcome, Maria. Mm, welcome. Thank you for having me, ladies. Thank you so much. Yeah, and you do so much. It's hard to cover all in, in one bio, in a short bio. Right. So I'm excited we have this conversation time to get talking about that and yeah. and really just diving into the heart behind what you do. And mm -hmm. so just kind of take us at the beginning of your journey. What is your story? How did God find you and really set you on this course? Yeah, that's, you know, I, I, when people ask me that, I always say it's like kind of a loaded mm -hmm. question, right? Yeah. Because, um, <laughs> right. He's chased us our whole lives. I remember when I was a child, I was a kid, I was, I was, I was abused pretty, pretty bad. And the only time I wasn't hit, so I would get, especially the weekends, like the weekends were really bad for me. Mm -hmm. So, but when we would go to my aunt Rita's house, we would drive upstate New York. And I remember as a kid, it was the funniest thing. I would look out the window in the car in the back and I just knew it was like God protecting me wow. and I could feel him watch over me. So as a child, I knew that there was God looking after me, but you know, I took a, a very interesting path, but it wasn't until I actually, um, the nonprofit that we was founded in 2012 kind of really, um, works in conjunction with God pulling me closer to him. And um, it all started in about October of 2011. Just things were not good. You know, married, I was engaged, that broke off. I was paralyzed from my neck down. Wow. And I had a miracle happen within 24 hours. Someone actually laid hands on me and prayed in the hospital bed. Um, and then I was asked to go to Argentina. <laughs> in the midst, it was October, November, and then December, I was asked to go to Argentina. And um, I went to Argentina not knowing what I was going to do or why I was there, but I just knew I wanted to be there so bad. And I went um, to an orphanage to see if I could help them raise funds because they were a private orphanage at the time. And at that point in my life, I was putting together events to raise money for, you know, fun charities and, and organizations in Africa, particularly. And so when they asked me to go down and I had no faith, like, yes, I believed in God, but I who's Jesus, right? Like, mm. you know, I knew that there was a God, but that was about it. Um, when I went down there, I went with everyone who was Christian, right? And real hard believers, real beautiful <laughs> believers, right? And so I was the person who was questioning them. Like, why do you have to serve and do good for someone else? Can't you just do good? And like, I was that person who was just debating, right? Mm -hmm. And they just loved me and kept, you know, like, oh, silly, crazy Maria, you know? And by the end of the trip, I was definitely still not born again, but a lot of reality hit and the program that we, that I'm now currently running and is here because of Christ, um, was downloaded to me while I was there and not born again. And, um, which was remarkable and I could feel God speaking to me, mm -hmm. but again, I didn't know what this was. Right. And, um, I went to church on one of my last days in Argentina and this girl that took the liking to me, she was about 13 years old. Um, she, we were in church and it was in Spanish and I didn't fully understand anything and very much at least. And she put her hand on me, on my shoulder. And she started praying over me. This 13 year old who was sex trafficked and an orphan now is praying over me. Wow. And I'm now this, at this point, that's it. That was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I'm just sobbing, right? I'm just yeah. like full blown couldn't believe her strength mm. and just this joy, you know, that came from her. And I was like, I don't know what this little girl has, but that's something special. Mm. Still wasn't born again. 
and it took it took god um another like four or five months and then by july of 2012 july 10th i dropped to my knees couldn't do it anymore i said that's that and um, i gave my life over to the lord in my bedroom and it was a full moon that night i'll never forget it because i and that's what made me think he was always there because I remembered it triggered me being a child in the car and he allowed me to remember that. Wow. And, um, yeah. I hadn't thought about that in, you know, decades and sure enough, he's like, I never left you. I just needed you to invite me. Mm. And, yeah. and I think that's important too, to like, I just want to draw out this point because I think it's really good is God still speaks to you if you're lost, yeah. he still speaks to you as a child. I mean, you know, when we were in our mother's womb, he, he formed us and knew us. And for those listening that feel like maybe you're off track or maybe um, he can't speak to you or you've done this or that, or you're, you're unusable. Um, that's not true. And I love right. that about your, your story, Maria, is that um, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were, while we were still lost, he was giving you destiny and giving you blueprints mm -hmm. Uh, for his purpose and plan for your life. And, mm -hmm. and I'm so, I'm so grateful that that's the type of God we serve. That's right. right. Well, and there's one that you can look back on too and see, wow, he has been protecting me. He has been watching over me. He's had this plan all along. Mm -hmm. And I love that we serve a God that pursues us Yeah, because oh, yeah. so many times people see him and I've seen him as like this angry God that's just mad at me. And like, why haven't you gotten it right, Whitney? And it's like, no, he's the God that pursues us and loves us. And how can we love? It's because he first loved us. Like yeah. that scriptural, we love because he first loved us. So mm -hmm. he has to show that love for us to even be able to comprehend it and give it. True. And just so seeing, good. yeah, just seeing God as, as one who pursues us and just loves us. Mm -hmm. So I, you have such a powerful testimony. And this is only like a small part of it too. <laughs> Well, it is right. Yeah, no, it's, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. And, and now in hindsight, right, I can look and see the thread through my whole life. Mm -hmm. He called me to, to do this in Argentina and it's my whole life. Like I, it's just amazing. Yeah. And as an, and I think, uh, you know, Alicia, what you said about he, he works and talks to you, even if you're not a, like, you don't have to have like tongues and all this great stuff right all the manifestations of the holy spirit to hear god mm -hmm. and i think to discern yes one thing but then to just know like wait that was that was powerful that yeah. was you know you just know and um mm -hmm. yeah he spoke to me before i was even a believer wow and i i love the 13 year old girl that prayed over you as well because that's one thing we've discovered you know in honduras and and going on trips and working with orphan children and, and children that have been abused, um, that they, they really heal the broken child in you. And, and just because you see God's mercy and grace and, and love on them so much, and they have that faith and they mm -hmm. are walking in what, um, his healing and, and his restoration right. and they're bestowing that on others that that identity you know i don't even like calling them orphans because they're not you right. know what i mean like that's that's the only term really language we have a lot for people to understand their situation but they're not because they're so full of identity in christ in their abba father mm -hmm. and and so you you found in this moment this encounter in argentina yeah. the the girl prays for you and then what happens after that? What is this, this mission um, and rethinking missions mm -hmm. with Humanity Del Sol that you've started? Can you kind of walk us through that process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when, when I started to hear, because, so let me back up a second. This, mm -hmm. this one particular orphanage, and I think just all of Argentina, and you'll, when, you, when you see it, you'll understand. When you step foot on, on the ground there, there's just something different, right? And um, that that difference i again not being a believer i'm like gosh what is this you know like is it the sun you know I, i'm in the sun all the time this can't be just the sun the air. Um, the well sun. sure enough it's the sun right yeah, um, yeah. yeah so, so um needless to say i i felt this like this was like a paradise for kids and i walked onto this one property and i'm like if i was a child this would be you know my my playground right and just you know acres of land and it's green and you can see the mountains in a distance and they had a, a pool, which 
let's be real it's not like you know a pool like we would think of or you know a playground like we would think of but still it's like all these kids it's just so much fun and you see their laughter and their joy but now you know expand time into nine days it was I think we were there for 10 or 11 days and and you start to see and it's not just happiness right and like and now you're picking out these children and you're saying hold on a second like something's not right there you know you can see that they're thinking about something that really a child shouldn't have that much thought into whatever it was or the fight they had or um and so I started to hear the stories of what what these kids went through and I understood they weren't like orphans like we think like oh you know maybe I'm pregnant at 16 and I gave my child up for adoption these are real trauma you know, they came from um, their brothers and sisters, uh, raped, molested, abused. Some of them were murdered, um, sex trafficking, drug trafficking. I mean, it's the full-fledged trauma. And um, that's when I started to like, okay, these kids have so much more of a story than I actually first thought. And then I went about nine days into the trip, I went to a vineyard very, 10 minutes away from the orphanage. And that was like part of our cultural experience. Mm -hmm. And that vineyard was stunning. Like, beautiful absolutely beautiful i mean top of the line there's art there's wine food and i just think to myself why are we not tapping into this type of resource as an avenue to help these kids and what they need because at, at that point i had noticed the kind of therapy they needed and um and i said well, i need to make that happen and so that day that very day i i spoke to the owner of that vineyard and um that's when God downloaded this whole program. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, you don't want my money. And I tell the story now for almost 10 years, I tell this story. I said, no, I want your money, <laughs> I said, but I don't think that it's needed at this point. I think we can make money for each other. I can bring tours down here and bring them to your vineyard. And whatever we bring to you, you give us a piece, just like a normal commission. And from that commission, we could help all of these kids. Mm -hmm. And she found that to be super interesting. She is one of our biggest partners to date, wow. um, the Zuccardi family. And, and that's how we are doing it differently. We're not taking jobs away from anyone in the community. So um, we partner with the community and we uplift the community. And we come from God. I asked for years. Once I became born again, I asked, well, God, what's the scripture that goes with this mission? Like, what is it? What is it? And it took about six years, five or six years for him to fully unravel it to me. Mm -hmm. And it was Isaiah 61, one through four, well, really one through eight. And it's about the whole community. It's, it wasn't just orphans. And I think um, when, when we start to think of it, like I'm here to help, maybe it's just the poor, or I'm here to just help one particular sector. I think we miss the totality mm, right. of our call to make disciples on this earth. Mm. And, um, yeah, we're serving the orphans, but sure enough, you better believe we now have business owners calling us for prayer. Wow. We have their team members who, when we bring people there, when we, or when we bring our, our youth to do any internships or um, workshops or just, just to have a nice experience, the, the workers there are seeing the difference in the fruit of the spirit mm -hmm. and they're becoming impacted. This has become a community. It's not become, we're only here to help orphans. Wow. Right. You know? Yeah. And so rethinking missions is a little more of we don't want to take jobs away from people. We don't want to make them reliant on us. We want to give them the fish. We want to teach them how to fish. Yeah. We want to empower the community. We want to, we want to give them the tools that they need to, to be all that Christ has called them to be. Right. That is so good. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> I, I just love, you're such like an entrepreneur and so like business minded and stuff, but it's like when, when God has control over, sorry, when he lives in someone that has those giftings and those skills, I just get excited yeah. because so many times in the kingdom, like, you know, we're taught to, to be generous and to give and to volunteer and do these things, which are all good things. But sometimes we just jump into something and actually make matters worse. And there's right. a book, I think it's called when helping hurts. Mm. I have and it. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> No, and just talking about like, yeah, you can have the right intentions and the right motives, but if you're just taking all of that energy and just throwing it kind of without having an aim or a purpose, then we actually end up making the situation worse mm -hmm. than better. Or we just end up going to the 
to the same place and painting the same wall every two years that you go. <laughs> you just gave me a look. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have a story for you on that one. You know? yeah. it, it's, it's hard because at the end, like you said, I think you nailed it. You said you go there with the right intention, mm -hmm. but, and, and I think also there's something else to note, you know, when the Lord gives us an assignment, that doesn't mean shoot, go, like take out your gun and go take out and shoot and just go for it. It means, he's already working it. He's already, now it's time to prepare you to go for it. And, and he'll give you the green light. It took me from 2012 to 2018, it took him six years to mold me before I could move, before he said, go, it's time for you to go to the field. Now I, you know, we had tons of work. We, we, I went down as often as I could, but it took six years for him to say, you can go now. Wow. And right. And that take, or I could have done what I would really, I really wanted to do. In the first year, I was ready to move. And thank God, thank him for having a mentor to say, it's not your time yet. Mm. Stay put, you know, because otherwise I would have spent the money. I would have went overseas and I probably would have failed tragically. And who knows what the enemy would have done with that failure, you know? Right. But um, I think the obedient side of it and, and it was so important, you know, like just because God gave you or you get a prophetic word or you, God has made it very audible to you. Like it's, this is what you're going to be doing. And you just know that, you know, that, you know, in your gut mm -hmm. doesn't mean go. It yeah. means start to get deep in the Lord, start That's to right. sit there and start to ask the questions and mm -hmm. build the plan with him, you know? Yeah. And you've built relationships, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. we go into, and in, do humanitarian work in other countries or things. And we want to Americanize um, each place that we go into. This is how we do it. We're Americans. Right. And, you know, I love America. Like I'm so, yeah. I'm glad to be here. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> yeah. but there's beauty in other cultures. Right. There's, there's beauty in craftsmanship from other cultures. I'm sure in Argentina, like you said, the wineries and the, the paint, uh, the painting and the arts, um, the language, the language, places, yeah, yeah, the architecture, just, just the masons or this, everything, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and that it's so important that we don't try to push our agenda, uh, in the name of the Lord, like you said, just yeah. go out guns blazing, but instead appreciate what God has cultivated there. Mm -hmm. Appreciate, um, the culture and how they do relationships. And, and I, that's what I love about what you're doing is it's community based. Yeah. It's not, Oh, they're coming in and they're just working in this little corner of, of the city or whatever. They're infiltrating every, every aspect, the mm -hmm. business aspect arts and um, really gets everybody on board and, and really creates a community who's taking care of each other as well. Right. Yeah. And, and I think it's important when we think of us coming in as, especially the, the North American way is coming in and, okay, we can build this, this, and this, and this. So a great example, we've done that. We did that at one particular orphanage and um, which again, they come with such a beautiful heart. Yes. They spent thousands of dollars to take a flight down there and then they spend another of their time, which is a several thousand dollars of time plus you know materials. So they had our team come down and they built the electrical. They did the electric work. <laughs> so you do the electric work, which is great but it was completely not to code oh, no. and they almost shut the orphanage down um, in 2018. And so what did my, my organization, we had to then put the money up and we hired locals and they redid all of the electrical. So we waste, how much money did we just waste? Mm -hmm. Because right. we thought we were doing the right thing by going down and using our talents that are great in the States, mm -hmm. but did not translate because it's not to code, you know, or, you know, we had, we rebuilt a whole, a whole, um, learning center. And then a church came in not even a month later and they, <laughs> Whitney, to your point, they painted the same wall. And it's like, we just spent hundreds of dollars on paint and you didn't need to do that, you know? And it's, so then the question becomes, well, then what do missionaries do? Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's the big, that's the differentiating factor in missions is, how can we serve your community? Do you mm. need increased skills? Can we, can we help come along and give you skills or new techniques? You know, like when you ladies come down, that's going to be tremendous for music, for art, you know, music art, right? Mm -hmm. and music therapy, excuse me. So I, I think it's having a different mentality and saying what's sustainable and where do you need help? You know, understanding what they need versus what we think they need. Mm. 
Right. Well, and that it's takes, crazy. that takes building relationship, like oh. Alicia was talking about earlier. And it's, it's not coming in with, okay, well, we think they need this, this, and this. And so we're going to do it, but just taking time to sit with the locals or to sit with the kids or the, the staff that you have there and just saying, okay, what, what do you see? Like, where, where do you need help? What are some issues? What are some solutions we can come up with to make your life easier mm-hmm. or to make these kids' lives better? Mm-hmm. And there's so much that you're saying, like, this is my degree <laughs> field right here. Like, I literally got my my degree is nonprofit business and social enterprise. So, like, mm-hmm. I'm eating this interview all up. <laughs> <It's a piece. laughs> yeah. But I think when going to school, like, and of course, we've done missions work on the on field too, but just realizing that things, like, I donate my clothes and we would we would even bring suitcases with us when we went to Honduras of clothes and then realizing that, oh, because we do that, like the textile industry is completely shut down. Um, obviously not just because of the clothes we no, brought, but yeah. um, just because that's been something that's been happening for decades. And I think some Christians just don't know that. And like we yeah. said, they have the intentions, they have the heart, but when we're shipping our clothes to whether it's Africa or South America or wherever, like that's jobs we're taking away from, you know, we talk about jobs being taken away in America. Well, we shouldn't go take other people's jobs in other countries (laughs) either. So just, um, you know, just realize it just kind of doing your research and thinking into things that, um, you know, how can, how can we better help? How can we use people? Like you said, how can we use people that are already there, give them work because the unemployment may be high there, or, you know, instead of just bringing people in, why don't we start bringing the community Mm. into this? And I I think it's also a very humbling experience when we have to, you know, I've had to tell people like, I actually prefer you not come and just give me your money. And that is a hard conversation to have because if you're not going to offer, or there's, if you, well, if you're not going to offer the skill or, or something, and you're like, I want to build something. Well, I don't have anything for you to build. I have workers there. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes it would be, it's advantageous to say, you know what, I'm going to do something selfless and I don't need to be the face behind that money, Mm -hmm. or I don't need to be, you know, and that, that's a real hard stomaching kind of position to be in is saying, you know, what if I made a bigger impact by not going on the mission trip? Mm. What if I actually increased the Lord's blessing by not going? And, and listen, we make, we make funds by people coming on mission trips. So it's not like I'm saying, don't go on a mission trip. It's sometimes you have to ask yourself, am I going to contribute in a way that's effective to society? Like you said, or, or is it just better? I stay home and give them the money mm, because right listen, you're not just giving your time, right? You're spending flight, luggage, you know, all the stuff that you have to spend money on. That's thousands of dollars. Could you imagine if you gave us thousands of dollars to go put out advertising to make more money and now we can hire more people to do the work? Like yeah. see how it works. It's a very different mentality and it's hard to, and I think especially because it's, you know, been brought down that that's how we have to do it. I think it's a generational thing. We've been taught you know, you go and you, you go to them on the mission field and you do certain things and you play, you know, with the orphans and you build something and that's great. And like, you can go home feeling good about it. And then what, what just happened? Did the impact, was it, was it sustainable? Was it, right. was it viable? Did you, is it long-term, you know, is it long-standing? Long-term. And it's really hard to think like that because you are coming from a great place, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think, you know, I, I totally agree people are coming from a great place. Their, their hearts are wanting to serve and, you know, going on overseas missions changed my life. Going on trips changed my life, changed your life, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we're definitely not against that or just, but pray about it and, and, and ask the Lord to search your heart and and ask, what are my intentions through this? What do I want to do through? Like, are you really calling me to it? Or is it something that will look good on paper or or whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, what are the intentions and heart behind it? And I think that's really important going into it because you may end up doing more damage than good. And we don't Mm -hmm. want that. We don't want that. We don't want Christ's name to be in that Mm -hmm. same, you you know, sequence or same sentence. And so with your mission as well, I believe you equip the youth and you even help them in an economical stance as well, right? With some of these businesses that you're partnering with, like, can you tell us a little bit about that? Cause I love, I love that aspect of it. Yeah, 
Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, they, um, so what happens when the youth turn 18, it's actually the same in the States. I, I believe one day we will be in the States. You turn 18 and you become a statistic. If you're coming out of an orphanage, right? You're, I think it's like a 92% chance that you're on the street. I mean, it's wild. The, the, the statistics are unbelievable. Um, so same with our kids. They are 18 years old. They have been taught no viable marketable skill at all. Um, they don't, they, no one's taught them how to budget. No one has taught them how to save. Uh, they have no viable skill to go to work with the exception of like maybe going to work on a vineyard or something really just kind of hands-on. Um, they have no technical training. So when they turn 18, um, we go ahead and we get them a mentor when they come to, if they agree to come to us, because it's all at that point at 18 years old, you're an adult. And so they agree to come with us and they have to agree to our kind of way, which is we pray, <laughs> we pray a lot. Um, we do believe in deadlines and we do hold you accountable. You know, you have, you know, three shots and you got to go because that means you're not serious about this. And we spend a lot of money on, on each child. It's not like this cookie cutter program that, okay, it's a hundred dollars each month per child, you know, um, I'm sorry, I'm calling them child youth. And so we, we do have very strict guidelines, but we allow every person the opportunity. And if they want it and they want it bad enough, they go for it. And it's funny to see that, to see the kids that just keep using the same excuses and listen, they have some excuses that they should, that, that are rightfully used. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then you see the, the child, the youth that is like, my life will never be what my parents did to me. It's amazing, you know, to see the two. And so we come in, we assess them, we get them psychological, um, an assessment, a psychological assessment. And then we find out, okay, this child, this youth has X, Y, and Z going on. Um, what's their situation? Are they currently working? Are they not working? And then from there, we've assigned them to their mentor who is a disciple. You know, we, they teach them how to pray. They teach them how to read the Bible. Um, so far we have our youth being born again that way. And it's not like a lot of them still drink and a lot of them go have, you know, they get crazy sometimes, you know? And so if you think, you know, we're going to reprimand you. We're not, we're going to love you. We're not going to say, how could you do that? You're ruining your chance with us. No, we, we love them. We actually don't condemn. Um, we actually tell them you can do what you think is right for you. And we give them that choice, but we're not going to leave your side. Mm -hmm. And then they know like, man, I did something wrong here. And what they do is often they try to, um, combat you and they try to see if you're going to stay or not because everybody's left them right and so we just always stand our ground with love and from there they they have a prerequisite and they they start uh, it's called finding your why by simon sinek i'm sure you ladies know that book and so we bring them through that book they find their why and then they determine which avenue of study they want to go into and based on um really it's a personal preference um they can go into tourism they can go into gastronomy event planning furniture making and accessory design and um, gastronomy. So they can learn how to be a chef. And based on that, based on the tourism industry and hospitality industry, um, they are then moved into technical work, like technical study and technical work. And we partnered with the region's top hotels, restaurants, tour operators, vineyards i mean it's the who's who is on our list and um they get to learn the skills directly from the professionals so our curriculum has actually been co-developed by myself and the professionals in the industry and um once they finish their actual you know let's say the profession that they're studying under they have to take a 400 hour practicum it's an internship with one of our partners again working with one of the best of the best in the region and then they get interview skills by uh, Argentina's largest human resource company mm -hmm. and they build their resume and the cycle's broken wow. because in conjunction to this, they have therapy. Oh, that's good. And of course, discipleship, right? right. So right. the idea is a total solution versus let's just give them therapy or right. let's just give them skills or, you know, it's a much harder and longer <laughs> process, but um, it's total you know, it's a total solution. You know, again, wh wh what does the word say? You know, if a man's hungry and you say, I'll pray for you. Oh, 
that's what does that do really you know what, what does that really do so we want to give them everything possible and we give them transition homes as well that's something new mm. because we realize how can you give them therapy in school and then they're on the street you see so right. that's become the biggest priority right now is getting them all into transition homes I hope that answers your question because it's a long one. Cool. It's really very big what we do. Yeah, that's awesome. And you can just tell this is a God-given plan mm -hmm. because it's literally, I mean, it's breaking generational <laughs> poverty. Yeah. And it's yeah. something yeah. that could, yeah, something that's had, it's just been a stronghold for families for generations and generations. And yeah, it takes more work, but it's thorough mm -hmm. and they're going to be whole. If they, if they give all of themselves into this program, they're going to be whole. They're going to have the skills they need to get a job and to raise a family. Um, I, I love it. Yeah, I agree. And uh, so last thing I want to talk about for today um, is the humanity wine company that yes. you have. Um, it's a social enterprise and you've just recently launched this. And so tell us about that because some of our listeners may be interested and that's, partnering with you in this. That's right. This is like a big, a big deal. You know, when you see a dream come true. So obviously all these wineries in Argentina, I'm like, why don't we make wine and sell it? Cause that'll be the largest, you know, margin, um, of anything we can do, whether it's missions or even just donating when someone donates. Right. I just think there's so much more money to be made when you're selling a product, especially wine. And so, um, we partnered with some wineries down in Argentina, and I always envisioned this social enterprise of wine being the place where our youth can then get hired, because right now they're only getting hired from our partners, but one day they can actually stay in the humanity family mm. and start to work for the humanity wine company, and hopefully one day lots more other stuff, right? Um, so this wine company, we give 12 bottles of wine every quarter, and we have dedicated 50% of our profits. So mm -hmm. there is no other wine company in the world, I can say that now, um, who does what we do. We are officially, it's a, it's a movement and uh, no one's giving 50% away. And I'm like, God, this has to be you because um, I just feel like everyone's ripe. Everyone's like, we're, we're, we understand purchasing power, but do we really get the impact that 50% of a profit of someone's for-profit company could do to the world. Right. Wow. We don't need to live on, uh, you know, the world does not need to be living on millions of dollars per person. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, we developed this company. It's really cool. It's called, you can be a wine therapist when you join us and you get um, a case of wine every quarter, you're considered a wine therapist. And it's this movement of food and wine and just a great time knowing that every time you do open a bottle of wine from us, um, which is really phenomenal wine. Um, and I can say that cause I have sampled all of them. <laughs> and, um, yeah, you, you know that you're helping these, these kids. And, um, so not only are we helping the, the youth program through this, um, but all of our wineries come from family owned wineries. All of our, excuse me, wine comes from family owned wineries. So we are helping the farmer, the local community. Again, again, it com always comes back to you know, Isaiah 61, one through, through four, and it's, it's proclaiming the year of the Lord. It is breaking people from their ashes and bringing them beauty. And all the, the whole, you can read the scripture and you just realize like, we're doing all of this and we're doing it in a really kind of unique way, you know, again, rethinking missions, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, yeah, Humanity Wine Co is humanitywineco.com is where you can get wine and read a little bit about our mission actually and why we're doing it because it's all there it's not just about the wine and um yeah so that's us as a wine company well like whitney and i say you're a boss i think it's so yes. awesome <laughs> you know just to even represent females in mm. business and um because women have they bring nurturing uh, compassion and just a mothering to even the business field that I think is missing. And I, I just love that you're doing that and, and, and helping the youth and helping the community um, in Argentina that you're doing. And so for those that want to get connected, so you mentioned the Humanity Wine Co. website. What about for Humanity Del Sol and the um, helping the youth and, and helping fund that? Where can they find that information at? Absolutely. Humanity Del Sol. So it's D-E-L-S-O-L dot org. 
humanitybellsoul.org. And, you know, thank you for saying that about me being this boss and whatnot. And it's funny because I've always like, I've always been an entrepreneur. I mean, I think my first company was, was like, I don't know, like 21 or something, 18. And I have been an entrepreneur, but I want to say something like I was never a successful entrepreneur because I didn't have a team and I didn't know how to cultivate a team. I didn't know how to lead a team. And what God's brought me through now, I understand that the team is everything. The family we've cultivated, the group, the people we have on our team now, they're unreal. Wow. And I think that's also another point. I know we don't have much time. I think another point is I don't just hire Christians. I hire non-believers mm -hmm. and it just so happens that they all become born again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's how it's so it's like, you know what? <laughs> If it's the person God has for us, then that's the person. I'm not going to say, are you a believer or not? And sure enough, they become born again. Wow. So it's the team. And, you know, I thank you for acknowledging the work I do, but the work I do is nothing if without, without the village and the, the people around me. Right. That's yeah. good. I just love all the layers. You just, you, your ministry and what you do, your business has all layers. And, and like you said, it takes a village and, um, I love that about what you're doing and we're so excited that, you know, we're, we're hoping to take a trip here soon and see, seeing yeah. all the, what's going on and being a part and teaching music therapy and just that we're so excited about that as God opens that up and, and we continue to work towards it. But thank you so much for joining us. Yes. And this has just been an inspiring conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me and letting me speak about this mission and vision and, and, um, my passion, you yeah. know, my why. Thank yeah. you. Anytime, anytime. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for joining us on coming up higher. We will have, uh, all of her contact information in the description so you can reach out and we would definitely encourage you to partner with humanity del soul in any way you can, even if it's just in prayer, uh, yeah. or finances, however, because, um, it's a, as you've heard today, it's a great, method and process that they use that's really breaking the cycle of poverty uh in argentina so yes. well uh, God, maybe more places to come yes. you never know <laughs> yes. that's right. but well god bless you guys and uh tune in next time